Thank you for watching this sermon from Kings Park International Church. Be sure to check out the other sermons in this series as well. Good morning. So glad that you're joining and tuning in this morning, whether in your PJs, on your bed, in the living room. I am just so glad that you're tuned in. I have the privilege and the opportunity of introducing our new series titled Come and See. In this series, you can find in the book of John chapter 1, particularly in verse 39, when the disciples come to Jesus and they say to him, Rabbi, where are you staying? And he says to them, come and see. And he's saying to them, come and see, not just come see where I live, but come see how I live my life and what the Lord has sent me here to do that you might believe. And in that same way, John in the book on the gospel of John actually is telling us or introducing us to come see Jesus and to see why he's come here on earth. He's come to save us. So we're not just coming to see the miracles that point to the fact that he's our savior. We're coming to see so that we too might believe. This morning, I'm opening up the series titled Jesus, Redeemer and Restorer. And this is exciting, this is important. And if there's anything that I want you to remember, if there's anything, if you'd, let's say at the end of all of this time together, you can't remember anything, I do want you to remember this one point, this one theme, this one thought. Now the miracle of redemption is accompanied by the process of restoration. The miracle of redemption is accompanied by the process of restoration. That's what we see in the text that we're going to be going into today, the very first miracle of Jesus Christ, where he turns water into wine. And it's it's important for us to note that this is the first miracle that John, public miracle that John is sharing and, and introducing us to, because again, it points to the fact that Jesus is our redeemer and restorer. Now, what do I mean by that? I want to start by sharing a personal story of what that means. I call it the bedside table story. I am a DIY girl. I love to take things that nobody wants and I can just figure out how I can make it functional for me. And that's why I love HDTV and a particularly fixer up or just something about that is right along my alley. And I remember we had just moved into our home and we had put all our furniture in place, but we needed just one piece to anchor two chairs together to solidify the space. But we weren't gonna spend just random money, of course. We wanted it at a good deal. And I was walking in Target like I usually am, going up and down the furniture aisle, and I noticed a piece of furniture that was on clearance. It was this bedside table, it was white, but I was wondering why it was on clearance, because it looked okay. The original price was $113. It was on clearance for $25 simply because there was damage, and it looked beat up. It just looked like there was no reason for them to sell this, and it made sense. So in that very moment, I just thought, ooh, I got a plan for you. And so what I did is I redeemed this item from Target. I purchased this item from Target. And I brought it home, sat it where I wanted it to be, made sure it would anchor well with the chairs, and it did. And then after a while, I took the time to sand it down because I didn't want it to be white. I have kids, and you can just imagine the fingerprints on there. So I sanded it down, changed the knobs, and just painted it the color that you see right now on your screen. And I I mean, we just put it right there, and people walked into our home not knowing the history behind it, but the process of restoration that went into it, and they just thought it looked like a beautiful piece. In the same way, Jesus wants us to know him as someone that redeems us or purchases us back, to redeem is to purchase, right? But not only that, but to restore us back to the full function and the full purpose of why we were created. And we can experience that in Christ. So why is this important? Why is redemption and restoration so important? Well, number one, we all need to be redeemed. In fact, we can find that in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, it specifically says, But when the fullness of time has come, God sent forth his son of woman born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. That is the promise is Jesus wants to redeem us that we might have a reconciled relationship with God. But the second reason why this is important and this is for everybody is because Quite frankly, nobody planned for COVID-19. Nobody planned to be interrupted. Nobody planned for the loss that we would all experience as a result of this pandemic. 
We've all lost something. We've lost time. We've, some of us loved ones. We've lost business deals. We've lost money if you are a small business owner. If you're a student at school, you've, you've lost time with friends. I mean, for those of you that are seniors, whether in high school or in college or just in a graduate program, you've lost that moment where you get to celebrate the hard work that you've spent all this time doing. We've all lost something, and we, we hope and long for some kind of restoration. And even deeper than that, some people have lost something and it's actually brought on shame. And I want to tell you today, there's good news for us. There's good news for you. And that news is that Jesus has come to redeem and to restore what was once lost. But I want to focus on the process of restoration. Because a lot of times when we don't understand this process, we might do things inadvertently that actually block or prevent, or delay the process of restoration. I mean, have you found yourself sort of going around a mountain and you're believing God to do something, but you seem to be going around all the time, like it's that same thing, it's that same issue. Well, if you have an experience that I have personally, and it's because when I look back at some point, I may have done something to slow down the process of restoration that God is trying to build. And so this brings us right now into the text that I'm going to be reading to you, but I want to first open us up in prayer. So would you join me as I pray, as we get into the Word of God and find out just the encouragement that He has as we understand the process of restoration. Father, we thank you so much for this time. I thank you for this time with our friends and just as we gather in front of the screen, wherever we are, to hear your word. Lord, let it be that we sense not just your presence, but God, that you speak directly to every situation where we have experienced loss. Holy Spirit, have your way. Thank you for your time, for time with you this morning in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm going to be reading from the book of John, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. And it goes, The next day there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, that's not our problem, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine, but you have kept the best until now. This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. The miracle of redemption accompanies the process of restoration. And I believe it's because God wants us to believe in him. If you're a note taker like me, I like to know where I'm headed. And so I want to tell you that I want what I have discovered and get into the scriptures are four things that I believe are important to know or to keep in mind as we go through the process of restoration, where God comes into our lives and he restores us. It's a process that we might be, believe in him and become who he's called us to be. And those four things are number one, the representative, also known as an advocate. Number two, the rescue or the divine intervention from heaven. Number three, the the resolution to follow through. And number four, the restoration. Let me explain these for you now. Mary, 
the mother of Jesus and Jesus and his disciples are invited to this wedding in Cana. Now, because both of them are invited, scholars believe that this must have been a close friend or a very good family member. They were well connected. And so this wedding was not just, let me go be a guest. It was like they were part of the family, rejoicing with this family. And back in Jewish culture, when there was a wedding, these celebrations lasted for more than a day sometimes. And wine was essential because it was their way, that's just what they did, but it was also their way of telling the family, telling the guests, excuse me, welcome, we're so glad that you're here and we want to be hospitable to you. So for the fact that the wine ran low or the supply ran out was a big deal because if the wine runs out before the wedding celebration is over, then it speaks that they're not taking care of their guests. I, for one, totally understand this. See, I'm Nigerian and in a Nigerian wedding, we like to throw down. I mean, if you've never, if you were invited to a Nigerian wedding, I just want to encourage you to go. It is so much fun. But I remember it was so important for my family that the food never ran out. Because you see, people are good people. You can have the best, beautiful wedding dress. You can have a wonderful reception where you host all your guests. But let me tell you something. It doesn't matter if the wedding pictures went viral on Instagram. If the food ran out, that was a stigma on the wedding. So it was important, not just to Nigerian culture, that I, you know, as I can identify, it was important to them that, listen, this is representing, of, representing our family, and we want our guests to know that special. So for the fact that the wine ran out, this was a big deal. So Mary runs to Jesus and says, listen, the wine has run out. And Jesus responds, what do you want me to do? Now we might read that in our culture and think that was rude, but really in that time was a term of endearment as in, mom, I don't know what you want me to do. But see, what Mary does, Mary serves as a representative of the family. She serves as an advocate. And she says to the servants, whatever he asks you to do, you just do it. Listen, when we're going through the process of restoration, God sends an advocate. The truth, first of all, is that Jesus is our ultimate advocate. In fact, we find and we see in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, where he, specific, where he specifically says, My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. And so what this means as a representative is like in a court case, the, the, your attorney or your rep represents you and presents your case before the judge and advocates for you. But sometimes Jesus is the ultimate advocate, but then sometimes he, they say we, are, we serve, we people serve as a small extension of who he is and we advocate for people. Let me tell you a little bit about a representative or an advocate. It's that person that steps into your life. And for the mere fact that they are in your life, your life enhances. They're the people that come into your life and they see your chaos. And instead of trumpeting out to everybody else that you have chaos, they help you to bring order. They're the kinds of people that see you struggling. And so instead of airing out your dirty laundry, they cover you. They try to cover your shame. And then they try to think of ways to support you to wholeness or to support you to come to a place where you can be healed. Ad advocates are like helpful helpers. They just come into your life and they genuinely help you. They don't mind inconveniencing themselves that you might be comfortable. Now, you see, the same way that advocates or representatives are helpful helpers, I need to tell you, though, there are some unhelpful helpers. And I pray that the Lord will help you so you only engage with helpers that are helpful. Let me tell you about unhelpful helpers. They're the people that step into your life. They tell you they want to help you, but it actually costs you more because they're in your life. They're the people that come into your life and they give you more things to worry about instead of the very thing that you're seeking help for. In fact, the best way I can describe it is that family member or that friend that comes for Thanksgiving promises to wash the dishes, but when the time for washing dishes after dinner happens, you can't find them. And then all of a sudden, they supernaturally appear after you've wiped down the last dish. Oh, sorry, I forgot. Mm-hmm, really. I pray that God gives you helpful helpers, advocates, representatives, because what they also do is that they call on the divine nature of God into your circumstance, which brings us to our next point, the rescue. 
the divine intervention. You see, Mary went to Jesus and told him about the circumstances because she wanted to cover the shame of the family. She didn't want anybody to know that the wine was running out. And what happened in this instance is that Jesus, first of all, says, what are we going to do? But then he looks around and he sees six jars, six stone jars that are typically used for other things. Listen, he uses what is available in that moment. When we experience loss, it's, it's very devastating. It's grief, it's discouragement, it's despair. But can I tell you that that's exactly what God wants to use. He wants to use your loss. He wants to use your grief. He wants to use the very thing that is causing you so much pain. What am I saying? Listen, it is our nature sometimes to want to dull away the pain by going to watch next Netflix and binging on it or getting on social media and just spending hours and hours at a time just into something because we don't want to deal with the pain. In fact, sometimes or some people actually engage in behavior that is destructive or maybe that's something that you're struggling with right now. I want to tell you that, listen, that pain, that grief, that's exactly what Jesus wants. He values your loss and your pain. Don't just shun it away. God wants to use it. Listen, that's what Jesus does. He looks around and he sees empty jars, empty jars, and that's what he wants to use. He wants to use your emptiness. In fact, in Psalm 56 verse 8, it specifically says, you keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book, your pain, your sorrow, your loss. It matters to the Lord, and he wants to use that for his glory. And so we see that there's this divine rescue where Jesus is going to use the empty jar. So what does he do? This connects us back right now to the resolution, the follow through. You see, he asked the servants, to go get water. Sometimes, and this is the step that I believe that some of us miss out on. It's the follow through. So key in, listen in, because this is the word for you. The follow through, he tells the servants to go get water to fill the six stone jars. Each jar has an average of 25 gallons. And back then, y'all, there was no faucets. There was no kitchen tap. They had to go to the well. And they had something just like this to get water. So these servants were not just taking the stone jars because it was very heavy and going to get water. Oh, no, no. What they did is they got these, these, these vessels like this, and they will go to the well, get water. And you know what they would do? They'll pour it, and they'll go back. They'll go get water. They pour it in. They go back. And all of a sudden, there's this process of going back and forth. It looks trite. It looks mundane. And in fact, it sounds antithetical. What do I mean? They were asking for wine. Jesus was telling the servants to get water. And then on top of that, they were going back and forth. Let me tell you the truth. If I was one of the servants, I would probably say to myself, man, that Jesus is a little cray-cray. What are we going to do with all this water? Why do we have to go back and forth? But you know what? He says anyway, and they believe him. They, he gave them the instruction, and they followed through. Listen, I don't know where you are or in the process of whatever restoration, but if there's loss, God might be asking you to do something that might feel antithetical to what it is that you're believing him for. I mean, listen, there's sometimes where we need a financial breakthrough, and this happened even recently, and God tells me to give. I'm asking for money, and he's telling me to give. Or maybe you are a small business owner, and you, you've come to a, between a rock and a hard place with everything going on, and the Lord, and you're saying, God, give us a breakthrough. Give me insight. Give me wisdom. What should I do? And then God all of a sudden tells you, why don't you go serve in children's ministry? Why don't you join this Go team and do something and you're thinking, what does that have to do with the, I want me wanting some kind, of, want, want some kind of solution? Well, what he's saying is sometimes that process of going back and forth, that process of doing what so seems so simple, that process of doing what so seems so trite is the very process where you're going to experience something in him that is necessary when that restoration comes. Not only that, you build trust. It says in James, it's James chapter 1, Verses three and four, it says, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Let me tell you something. We live in a culture where everything is instant. Everything is instant. 
Microwave is instant, two-day shipping, if not the next day. We have things that where you bring your grocery, groceries when you need them. I mean, everything has, is so quick. In fact, in my household, when they, when they want to watch something and it's loading and it takes more than 10 seconds, oh my gosh, everything needs to stop. The internet is the worst. We want everything to happen instantly, but this is what God is saying. Sometimes my process doesn't happen instantly. It's actually repeated, and it keeps going and going and going. And because it goes like this, we want to give up. Little do we know that this is the process that Jesus wants to use to bring that miracle and that process, that miracle of redemption and full restoration into our lives. Follow through. Be resolved to follow through. And then finally, the restoration. Jesus, they bring all the water. They fill the jars. He tells the servants to take the water and go feed it to the masters of ceremony, master of ceremonies. And the master of ceremony t- tastes what is now wine. And he's flabbergasted. He can't believe a new trend has started. A new trend where they don't just save where they don't just give the best thing first, they save the best for last. This is the favorite part of this scripture for me. And I hope it encourages you because I want you to catch what Jesus is doing in this situation. Let's do a little bit of math. So high school students, middle school students, you're watching, just follow along with me. We have six stone jars, each one holding an average of 25 gallons. Let's convert those to milliliters. So one gallon, gives you 3,875, I believe, milliliters. You multiply that together and you get 94,635 milliliters. There were six stone jars, so a total of 150 gallons. So 150 gallons, and you multiply that to convert it to milliliters, that gives us 567,810 milliliters. I did a little bit of research. The standard wine bottle in our culture today is 750 750 milliliters. So when I do the math and I divide, what Jesus did that day when he prayed over the water is he created 757 bottles of wine. Not only did Jesus redeem that moment, but he brought the kind of restoration that brought back abundance. Do you see the miracle? Do you see what God wants to do in your life? 757, typically during that time when there were weddings, honestly, maybe 200 people at the most, if I exaggerate. But they had 757 bottles of wine. But not only that, the master of ceremony says, oh my gosh, this is the best wine ever. And when I think about best wine, I'm thinking about either vintage wine or aged wine. Now with aged wine, that means this wine has been stored for years and years and there's just been this amazing chemical reaction that creates this best tasting wine. You know what Jesus did? When I look at the scripture, how I see it is, Jesus took however many years to create the best wine, the best aged wine, and in one moment, he created something remembered and covered the shame of that family. When God restores us, I even want to help you understand this with these little chest pawns right here. If this is where you are, this is where you hope to go. This is the pathway. Somewhere along the lines, you got deterred and it pushed you all the way back. So you experienced some kind of loss. Not only does Jesus put you here, right? He brings you where you were supposed to be. That's the process of restoration. That's the miracle of redemption. That's what Jesus wants to do in your life. And he does this. And John helps us to see this. Why? Because he wants us to believe in this God that redeems and restores and brings us back to full of who we should be. Listen, there might be some physical things that you've been praying to God for that you've lost. Maybe it was money and investment. Maybe it's time. Maybe it's friendship. In fact, I just really hear by the word of the Lord that there's someone watching and you've said, what will God want to do with this wasted life? Listen, your life is not wasted. 
It's just prime for redemption and restoration. Your situation is not that difficult. God specializes in the worst cases. He desires for, for us to come to him, to believe in him. And that's what John wants us to see. And that's why he introduces himself as the redeemer and the restorer. God wants us to believe in him. He wants us to come and see. Jesus calls us to come and see him as redeemer and restorer so we can believe in him. Listen, if you are an unbeliever today listening and you're saying, this is resonating, but what must I do? We're going to have an opportunity to pray and pray that, listen, that you will experience the miracle of redemption and you will walk through the process of restoration that you will, and that you will take the time and that you will trust God to walk you in seeing when God sends an advocate into your life or a representative. Sometimes, though, we have to be careful because we shun representatives or we shun advocates because they don't look like we thought or they come in packages that we don't necessarily relate to. Maybe there's someone older and you think you, they can't relate to you or it's someone younger and you think they're maybe annoying <laughs> or maybe it's someone with a different socioeconomic status. But I want you to key, key in to what God is doing. He's going to send an advocate, a representative, and then comes his rescue, the divine intervention into your situation. And then we must be resolute and show that we're going to go through the follow through no matter how long it takes, no matter how long we need to prophesy, we need to speak the word over our circumstance, no matter how long we need to pray, no matter how long, God, we're doing something that seems so antithetical, but trust that God is in there. And then we walk in the fullness of the restoration that we, that he has for us. If you are a believer as well, and you are experiencing some loss, I have a word for you. God is in the business of restoration. It might not look like the way you thought, but God surely wants to do something in your life. Listen, nobody planned for this pandemic, but you know what? I believe that God is going to do some amazing things in spite of it. If you believe and you lay down your heart and say, God, Show me yourself as redeemer and restorer. Let's pray. If you're listening and tuning in right now and you don't know Jesus, that is the only way. That is the only way that you can fully understand and engage and, and just really and receive all the gifts that he has for you as redeemer and restorer. And I want to give you an opportunity today. So would you pray this with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for your love for me. I confess that I am a sinner and I have taken my own life into my, and I've just done what I want to do. I've been rebellious. Please forgive me. Now, Lord, come into my life and do a new work. Not only redeem me, but restore me. For your purpose, I put my trust in you. You are my Lord, in Jesus' name. And now for those of you that believe, or everyone else, let me pray a prayer for you. Holy God, I thank you for this moment where we are reminded that you are the God that redeems and restores. I speak now, Lord, to every circumstance and every situation where people feel like they're behind or people feel like they've lost so much, particularly loved ones, and they have no idea how to continue or what it would even look like to experience restoration. But God, you know every single one of us and you know our circumstances. So Lord Jesus, visit every household, visit every person, whether they're they're at home or in an office because they have to work. God, wherever they are right now, I am asking for a divine intervention into their circumstances. I pray that you will send them helpful helpers, advocates that would stand for them and their lives might be better. I pray that they will come to know you as the ultimate advocate. And I pray, God, that you would give them the tenacity, the courage, and the boldness to, and the faith to trust you so that they can follow through in the process. And God, I pray that when you come and you bring your restoration, that even though it may not look like what they thought, and it, might, it will be something new that you've created, that they will embrace it and walk in it and rejoice in you. So we thank you, God, for this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching. If you have questions or prayer requests, 
please email us at info at kingspark.org or message us on one of our social media channels. If you would like to give, you can do so by visiting kingspark.org giving or by downloading the Kings Park app.